So six days later, six days later after what? Six days after Jesus tells his disciples, all of them, that they have to go to Jerusalem, that they're on their way to Jerusalem, and when they get there, he will suffer many things at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees, and he'll be killed, and then he will be raised on the third day. Six days after that pronouncement to his disciples, while they're still reeling because of what he just told them, he takes three of them, his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, up to a high mountain. They speculate about the Mount of Transfiguration, where it is. It's somewhere near to the east, they think, or the west, rather, of Tyre and Sidon, up in that area, which is pretty mountainous. But he, he takes them up into a high mountain. And there, they experience something pretty amazing. But just Peter, James, and John. Now, remember, Peter was the one... Who had, who had told Jesus, you can't do that. You can't go to Jerusalem and die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And yet, now, Peter is going with him up to the mount that they call the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter will open his mouth once more on the mountain. That's Peter's gift. They're about to witness an amazing sight as Jesus is transfigured. What does it mean to be transfigured? Your, your whole demeanor changes. And all of a sudden, his face shines with this white, white brightness. His clothes shine with this white, incredible whiteness. like light and not only that he has company Moses and Elijah appear with him now when I was growing up in the alliance we always talked about the Lord Jesus as being prophet, priest and king and here on the Mount of Transfiguration we have in real life the first major prophet Elijah The priest, if you will, Moses, the lawgiver. So we have the prophets, the law, and the king represented on the mountain. And they're speaking to one another. How did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> Only God knows. But you remember, Moses disappeared. They never found his body. He was 120 years old, but they never found a body. Elijah was taken up in a chariot. So neither one of them died in a traditional sense. But here they are on the Mount of Transfiguration. And what are they talking about? Where's Jesus going? He's going to fulfill the promise of God. He's going to Jerusalem to die and to rise again. But I believe that this is a, a reassurance that he's on course, he's on mission. And the law and the prophets confirm it through Elijah and Moses. Well, Peter's there, and Peter sees this, right? And he says, Lord, this is incredible. It's good for us to be here. Let me make some tabernacles. What's a tabernacle? It's basically a tent. Let me make three, one for each of you, and we'll worship you here. He wants to, the songs that you picked were great. It was perfect. Because that, that's what Peter wants to do. He, he says, we'll, we'll, we're here with you. Well, let's, let's worship here. Let's make this, you know, a, a great, great worship experience for us. And as he's saying this, a cloud overwhelms them all. And he hears a voice. They all do. Out of the cloud. Reminiscent of another voice at another time. Same voice, actually. 
A voice says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Sound familiar? Remember when Jesus was baptized? In Matthew chapter 3, Beginning at verse 13, it says, Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming, up, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. Behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Confirmation in both cases that this is the son of God. When, when they see this, when the disciples hear the voice, what do they do? They're scared, yeah, they fall on their faces. That's pretty common when there's an encounter with God or with one of his angels, that people just fall on their faces. But Jesus comes over and taps him on the shoulder, basically says, get up, probably with a smile on his face. They say, I expected this, but get up. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. How many times did Jesus say, don't be afraid in the, in the Gospels? over and over again when he appears after the resurrection what does he say when he comes into the room where they are shalom peace be with you but then he says well it's it's me don't be afraid and when they lift up their eyes you know they're, they're on the ground they're just laying prostrate on the ground and they look up and they're all gone nobody else is there it's just jesus he's not transfigured anymore he's not shining brightly and she says come on time to go no idea how long this took no idea he was conversing with Moses and Elijah but he was and they saw it Peter the, the, the opening scripture this morning Peter reflects on that when he's, he's saying listen that what we're telling you about Jesus is for real we were there we saw it we heard it we experienced it. We know for a fact that Jesus is the promised one. We're eyewitnesses. How valuable is an eyewitness? Pretty valuable? I'm not, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Michael. Yeah. Make your case? Yeah. So Peter says to the, the, the crowd that he's writing to in, uh, in, in Second Peter, he says, I was there. I was there. I saw him. I saw him transfigured, as a matter of fact. I saw the power of God on him. Back in Matthew chapter 1, we're introduced to John. I call him... I, I have this hang-up. I call him John the Baptizer because he wasn't a Baptist. <laughs> wasn't a Presbyterian. Wasn't a Methodist. He was a Jew. But he was the Baptizer. I don't know why they call him John the Baptist, but they do. But in chapter 3 of Matthew, again, it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. 
Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Nobody's come up with that as, as a diet or weight loss or anything else. How many of you would do it if they did? <laughs> no, Mike's back there shaking his head. Oh, oh no. No. And then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who wanted you, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Demonstrate your repentance. Don't suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the tree. Trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's talking about Jesus, who is on the, on the horizon. And the next thing that Matthew records is that Jesus shows up from Galilee. He shows up in Judea by the Jordan River and John baptizes him. Why do I go through all of that? Because the disciples have a question. Because Jesus says to them, don't tell anybody what you just saw until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Just keep it to yourselves. And they have a question about how things are about to happen. They say, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus says he has. Elijah is coming and will reveal all things, but I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. John is very, very similar to Elijah. Remember Elijah with Ahab? He, he walks into Ahab's throne room, and he, he just makes a pronouncement. He says, there's drought in the land. And he says, unless I say so, it's not going to rain. He turn around, turns around and walks out. And Ahab's sitting there on his throne saying, um, 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 <laughs> excuse me, I have a question or two. And Elijah's gone. But in the face of power, just like John was with the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, in the face of power, undaunted, unafraid, speaking truth to power. And John comes in that same spirit of Elijah. And Jesus isn't talking about reincarnation. He's just talking about John having the same spirit as Elijah and being just like Elijah. And what happens? Jesus says they treated him pretty badly. They threw him in prison, remember? Because he wouldn't shut up. And then they took his head. And Jesus says, I'm heading in the same direction. As we go to Jerusalem, the, the fascinating thing to me about Jesus is he doesn't hide anything. He tells them, everything that's going to happen, if you're going to follow me, <coughs> here's what's happening. Here's what we're walking into. So be prepared. And the other fascinating thing, as far as I'm concerned, is that the disciples keep going. They stay with him all the way in to Jerusalem. When he says the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands, <coughs> they don't say, well, I'm out of here. I'm going to go back to fishing. They, they go. They go with him into Jerusalem. And they go actually after the resurrection. 
when they begin to preach, they go with him all the way to death for almost all of them because it's worth it to follow Jesus. But the disciples understand that he was talking about John. Imagine the head full of stuff that they come down off the mountain with. It's an incredible, incredible moment in their lives. And they have to sit on it. Now, it's not that long until they get into Jerusalem and all of these things that Jesus is predicting take place. But they sit on it. They, they, don't, they can't tell anybody until after the resurrection. But boy, they do after the resurrection. They do it. But they stay steadfast. They follow Jesus. In the garden of olives, they bolt, but they show up again. When Jesus comes into the room after the resurrection and shows them his hands and his feet aside, they show up again and they're ready. They're ready. And then he spends those days with them before he is taken up into heaven training them basically, encouraging them, teaching them. But it begins here. And it begins with a transfiguration on the mountain that just knocks the socks off John and James and Peter. But I love what it says about Peter because he's ready to worship Jesus. At first he's ready to defend him and hinder him from going all the way to the cross. See, for people in that day, when, when you mentioned being crucified, they knew exactly what it meant. It didn't mean carrying difficult things in your life. It meant you're going to die. And you're going to die in the most horrific way anybody had determined in history. The Greeks first, and then the Romans thought it was a good idea, and they did the same thing. So you can understand Peter, as emotional as he was, saying, it's not going to happen, Lord. I can't, I can't let that happen. God forbid, he says. God forbid. And Jesus says, how can you say God forbid when it's God's plan? It's God's plan all the way. So that's when he says, get behind me, Satan. But then he takes him with him up the mountain and enables him, allows him to see this incredible moment in his life. Allows him to see the transfiguration. And he, he refers to it later on in his letter, in his epistle. But they're heading toward Jerusalem. This is one step, sort of a detour on the way, but it's not a detour, it's a part of God's plan but they're heading toward Jerusalem. Stay tuned. <laughs>